now you've heard many times now <laughs> the beginning talks and all the, all the stuff the gladness the collectedness and the seven supports of awakening and all the basic introductory discourses that I use to make a firm starting point for people but it's interesting because you already know all this and we can actually go a little bit further and touch more advanced topics which will be quite interesting I think and explore a little bit more what what the Buddha's teaching uh, is about in in the more advanced meditation practice I think and we will probably gravitate more towards slowly kind of understanding the four satipatthanas as as they are wise awareness as it is and what happens when uh, deeper states of release arise and how to actually maintain them which is the fourth effort to maintain <coughs> it's one thing to get there but uh, to maintain it is different so it's um, well it's not very <laughs> different but it's it's then a much more holistic approach which is you know I've been saying that even in the beginning but now even more so in, during the retreat and the retreat is this amazing opportunity to really become the practice kind of fully without any other distraction which is amazing so I think um, I will be using a couple of discourses tonight which touch about um, the 11 doors to the deathless <laughs> and um, also the donkey jhana <laughs> so uh, how to meditate like a thoroughbred <laughs> so and these suttas they really combine themselves very well and we'll, we'll see maybe I won't do maybe it would be a good one just one and we'll see how much I get talking about them but I never know um, but they marry themselves together very well because they touch uh, the same kind of topic in a different way in a different slightly different angles and that is how we practice when not when we we're beginning and we don't know what the jhanas are now now we know the jhanas are known now that's not a problem all the way so that's not that's not a problem now is is actually other tools to help us understand how how to deal with that in exactly with the topic that you brought up with doubt sometimes just slight that slight you know what's that and how to actually see the jhanas properly and actually how to develop wise awareness more and more and especially uh, dhamma as dhamma so
the first discourse. Now this is the numerical discourses. This is a sutta to Sanda, which is uh, a monk, and um, the Buddha teaches Sanda how to meditate like a thoroughbred horse, <laughs> not like a wild colt. <laughs> Am I saying that right? Colt. 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 Yes. Okay. Meditate like a thoroughbred sandha, not like a wild colt. And how does a wild colt meditate? When a wild colt is tied up near to the feeding trough, he meditates. Fudder, fudder. <laughs> food, food. For what reason? Because when a wild colt is tied up by the feeding trough, he does not ask himself, Now what task will my trainer set for me today? What can I do to satisfy him? Tied up by the feeding trough, he just meditates. Futter, futter. So to Sandha, a person who, l who is like a wild colt, when gone to the forest, to the root of a tree, or to an empty hut, dwells with a mind obsessed, oppressed by sensual desires, and he does not understand, as it really is, the escape from arisen sensual desires. Harboring sensual desires within, one meditates, cogitates, ponders, and ruminates. Another, in other words, proliferations. He dwells with a mind obsessed and oppressed by ill will, by dullness and drowsiness, the five hindrances here, by restlessness and remorse, by doubt, and he does not or she does not understand as it really is the escape from arisen doubt. The Buddha often used that term, the escape, from these hindrances, um, which is quite um, interesting, uh, very vivid, literally, uh, simile. And that denotes the third noble truth, and the fourth also. So he's using the, that vocabulary often uh, around the Four Noble Truths, which is really uh, constant in here. Harboring doubt within, one meditates, cogitates, ponders, and ruminates. It's just these, these five hindrances. Whatever they are, they're just doing the same thing in the mind. There's just that rumination. <laughs> and at some point, what I say is usually you get tired of it. You get wary of those. You just like, at some point you, you notice them. And then you understand that actually you're, that's you. You're taking that personal. <laughs> that's actually you're engaging with it. And it's sneaky because you think you're not. It's so ingrained. But as the mind, you just have to have trust. And remember, the mind goes deeper. And it, it will come. It has to. It will. <laughs> and that faith, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I remember. <laughs> and then, and then, and then actually, at some point, there will be strong awareness enough that the awareness will buoy up above these hindrances and it will be like oh you guys I'm tired <laughs> I'm tired of you but like you said before uh, you forget about them it's like okay forget about that it's, it works too it's the same kind of
and that wild cult now and that person like a wild cult he he or she meditates independence on the earth independence on water independence on fire independence on air independence on the base of infinity of space now sometimes the buddha talks about the four jhanas they're, they're the rupa jhanas the material jhanas or form jhanas sometimes he switched those up with the four elements so it's quite interesting uh, different approach but there are suttas where he says when you develop these four elements as uh, understanding you know uh, all this is nothing but the four elements um, there is this sense of impersonality that arises and one can actually go into the formless realms right away because it's just that level of detachment is there and s this this retreat we'll see a, a lot of variations like that there are a lot because it's very important I think to start with a very solid foundation to know all the jhanas up and down um, uh, and the Brahma Viharas have a good solid foundation in that but then when once that is in place now we can we can actually see how other things can be applied and that gets very interesting because that opens up the whole canon <laughs> and it really opens up a lot of different suttas which are um, now we can start understanding things differently and the more tools that we have like that the more we're able to apply them in a lot of different situations so so one meditates independence on the base of infinity of space independence on the base of infinity of consciousness independence on the base of nothingness independence on the base of neither perception nor non-perception independence on this world independence on the other world independence on what is seen heard sensed cognized reached sought after and ex examined by the mind such is the meditation of a person who is like a wild cult huh. <laughs> interesting <laughs> now you would think like a wild cult oh it's just like full of hindrances no he's even putting the formless jhanas in there and he doesn't give us too much of an option you know <laughs> it's like but that's normal that's the advanced practice so now we can talk about these things and actually we see the jhanas there's they're only the map of the mind it's no big deal we don't make a big deal of whatever jhana a person is in that's not the point the mind goes through these things that's just the nature of the mind when it's developed in that way through gradual cessation gradual release gradual letting go it will just experience these states so we don't there is no making that our base we know it's temporary it's you know the mind goes through that and it's going to change and it's going to go even deeper but we do not we never cling to that because we know for first a meditator knows that these more advanced states is even more blissful so why why holding on sometimes we get caught up a little bit like but the more it will go the more it will just be like uh, just this beaming joy and bliss and just going right into 
um, the jhanas, the mind just does its thing and there's no there's no resistance that is created by trying to really um, analyze or cling to a particular factor of the mind in those jhanas. And that freedom is in fact worth way more than any of these states, the freedom beyond that. And how Sandha does a thoroughbred meditate? When an excellent thoroughbred horse is tied up near the feeding trough, he does not meditate. Fudder, mm, fudder. For what reason? Because when an excellent thoroughbred horse is tied up by the feeding trough, he actually asks himself, Now what task will my trainer set for me today? What can I do to satisfy him? Tied up by the feeding trough, he does not meditate. Fudder, fudder. For that excellent thoroughbred horse regards the application of the goad as a debt, a bond, a loss, a failure. So too an excellent thoroughbred person, when gone to the forest, to the foot of a tree, or to an empty hut, does not dwell with a mind obsessed and oppressed by sensual desires, and he or she understands as it actually is the escape from arisen sensual desires. He or she does not dwell with a mind obsessed and oppressed by ill will, by dullness and drowsiness, by restlessness and remorse, by doubt. And he understands, as it really is, the escape from arisen doubt. Now the analogy of the the goad and the trainer uh, it varies of course there can be the teacher but I think it's more related to awareness itself and the hindrances because a, a thoroughbred horse or a thoroughbred meditator the goad is the hindrances and that's why the, the hindrances are the teachers in fact. So it's not actually referring to a teacher who would, you know, reprimand. Actually, that's not right. The punishment <laughs> itself, the goad itself, is the hindrance. <laughs> and these hindrances, like he says, it's the sensual desires, the ill will. But they know the escape because they see these hindrances as like it is said, a debt, a bond, a loss. Like in the Samling of Palasutta, when he says abandoning the five hindrances. Uh, it's like a person coming out of jail, coming out of debt. See, the same, very similar. The trainers, ourselves, He does not meditate in dependence on the earth, in dependence on water, in dependence on fire, in dependence on air, in dependence on the base of infinity of space, in dependence on the base of infinity of consciousness, in dependence on the base of nothingness, in dependence of, on the base of neither perception nor non-perception, independence on this world, independence on the other world, independence on what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, reached, sought after, or examined by the mind, and yet he meditates. 
so all these states they're all the states we go all through all of them whatever arises doesn't actually really matter just we just let go because that's the meditation meditation is about liberation not clinging to one of these states and I like that he goes to the neither perception or non-perception and he goes back to the world because then it's really integrating this whole thing and what is heard, seen, sensed, cognized it's actually yes you go maybe when sitting very deep but then you stand up again your meditation isn't over <laughs> it's just continuing and maintaining this and this is really where we get to really see that the Buddha's teaching is going to this there's no object of the mind that's what he's saying so clearly here we, there's no object anymore the object is freedom <laughs> it's the bliss of freedom and that becomes the base of the mind when he meditates in such a way the devas along with Indra, Brahma and Pajapati worship the excellent thoroughbred person from afar saying and these are the Hindu gods Homage to you, O thoroughbred person. Homage to you, O supreme person. We ourselves do not understand what you meditate in dependence on. Even the devas, they cannot know. It's, uh, there's this beautiful simile of the arahants. Even their mind is like the trace of birds in the sky. Nobody can know where they came from and nobody can know what it is. When this was said, the Venerable Sandha said to the Blessed One, but how, Bhante, does an excellent thoroughbred person meditate? Here, Sandha, for an excellent thoroughbred person, the perception of earth has disappeared in relation to the earth. The perception of water has disappeared in relation to water. The perception of fire has disappeared in relation to fire. The perception of air has disappeared in relation to air. The perception of the base of infinity of space has disappeared in relation to the base of infinity of space. The perception of the base of infinity of consciousness has disappeared in relation to the base of infinity of consciousness. The perception of the base of nothingness has disappeared in relation to the base of nothingness. The perception of the base of neither perception and non-perception has disappeared in relation to the base of neither perception or non-perception. The perception of this world has disappeared in relation to this world. The perception of the other world has disappeared in relation to the other world. Perception has disappeared in relation to whatever is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, reached, sought after and examined by the mind and I think a very wonderful example of this is the experience of Professor Jill Bolte Taylor and I thought that was really actually a wonderful example of that how it's very similar to having a purely right brain experience <laughs> where what this is saying is that 
these things are there, but there is no concept attached to them. So there is freedom from all of that. And sometimes you can experience that when you come out of very deep meditation. When sometimes you'll, you'll open your eyes and it takes a moment to understand where you are. Or maybe you thought you were actually facing another direction. Maybe it doesn't happen to you. <laughs> but maybe it does. Or something that's uh, one of the things that you see kind of creeping back in is all these this conceptual mind slowly because to operate in the world you kind of have to have concepts and ideas about things but when the mind is very deeply imbued and suffused in that liberation these concepts when they come back they you you can really notice that when like the machine starts going again and it's interesting because it's just a matter of how much you're willing to actually Uh, solidify things again but slowly this is moving towards you know um, making that home meditating in such a way Sanda an excellent thoroughbred person does not meditate in dependence on the earth independence on water independence on fire independence on air independence on the base of infinity of consciousness up to neither perception nor non-perception independence on this world independence on the other world independence on what is seen heard sensed cognized reached sought after or examined by the mind and yet he or she still meditates. And as he or she meditates in such a way, the devas along with Indra, Brahma, and Pajapati worship the excellent thoroughbred person from afar, saying, Homage to you, thoroughbred person. Homage to you, supreme person. We ourselves do not understand what you meditate in dependence on. Uh, there's that covers I think the beginning which I um, it's an interesting in introductory uh, discourse into the retreat so that we actually start on the foot of not um, of having a completely open uh, perspective on on wise awareness and the jhanas and the mind and not practicing donkey jhana <laughs> not putting our attention onto any particular point of it and that, see that's where you also see so vividly how it cannot be one pointed it's <laughs> everything away from that so it's really hard to reconcile these two things <laughs> <laughs> 
now we really get to see that actually any time the mind starts obsessing and oppressing about something it's donkey jhana it's the cult wild cult jhana or wild cult meditation because meditation i think the pali in this is the jhana actually for what is translated as meditation but i would have to look that up i'm not 100% And to actually allow these states to come up as they as they do, you you know the path, and that's when we understand the true application of the four satipatthanas, the four resting places of awareness, because we know how to develop the seven supports of awakening with joy, with letting go. We're used now. This is kind of embedded. It's it's there happening all the time that's not a question and so when that's there when that's in place then we can start understanding really how the four aspects of wise awareness work and how they're just they're just what it is it's like this <laughs> This is a nice, very nice addition because now we see we see it from one angle and now we see it from another angle. We'll probably see many angles this retreat on kind of this topic. But now we're this this uh, Dasama Sutta. It's uh, still in the book of eleven of the numerical discourses, but and in fact there is a. Uh, parallel in the Majjhima Nikaya and in the middle length discourse in the, this exact sutta and it's quite wonderful because it puts um, the jhanas and the Brahma Viharas and the formless jhanas all together as 11 doors to the deathless and how and now it's more technical it's more practical on how to develop the right understanding each of these things and it's the same really but um, I just think it's a nice addition to complement that that topic right now it's not very long um, and this I think in the Majjhima Nikaya, this is called the Atakanagara Sutta, which in this one is Dasama. Atakanagara is the place where Dasama is from. And Dasama is the, the lay, the householder. And um, he arrives at Pataliputta, which is modern day Patna in India, and which was supposed to be a very, the Buddha predicted it was going to be a very uh, affluential, influential um, town. Uh, and after his passing, it really became, uh, it did. And I think this is probably after his demise because uh, this is uh, Dasama goes to visit Ananda, and uh, there's no mention of the Buddha. And since Pataliputta is mentioned and Ananda, there's a few discourses which are probably after uh, the Buddha's passing, which are people going to Ananda asking. And Dasama asks um, some monk where, where Ananda is staying, and he says, oh, it's, he's in the. Um, the bamboo forest near Vesali and then he goes there and then he asks Bhante Ananda 
Is there any one thing properly expounded by the Blessed One, the Arahant, the Perfectly All-Awakened One, who knows and sees such that if a monk dwells diligent, ardent, and resolute in it, his unliberated mind is liberated. His undestroyed taints are destroyed, and his and he attains the as of yet unattained, unsurpassed security from bondage. This is kind of a stock passage. Meaning uh, final awakening kind of thing. Arahantship. There is householder. And what is it? Here, householder, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. A monk enters and dwells in the first jhana, which consists of joy and pleasure born of seclusion. Viveka. I say letting go usually. Accompanied by thought and examination, he considers this and understands it thus. This first jhana is constructed and produced by volition, by will. But whatever is constructed and produced by volition is impermanent, subject to cessation. If he is or she is firm in this, he attains the destruction of the taints, the destruction of the distractions, the stilling of the distraction. That's usually how I would translate that. But if he or she does not attain the stilling of distractions, complete stilling of distractions, because of that desire for the Dhamma, because of that delight in the Dhamma. Then, with the utter destruction of the five lower fetters, one becomes one of spontaneous birth due to attain final Nibbana there without ever returning to this world. I'm non returner. Um, and so, this is available even from the first jhana but it's um, it's not the usual sequence see now we're getting further now it's people they, they already know these things like they have already experienced that and now it doesn't matter so much whether you're in the first jhana or not but what matters is that you understand that insight that wise understanding that this is impermanent, even the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana. These are all impermanent. We, there is the development of them which brings the mind closer to understanding the right um, mental standpoint, sharpening the view. But the thing is that the more we <laughs> progress on the path, the m the more we realize that what might be more and more are the main hindrance is the Dhamma. And that's when we start talking about the importance of actually letting go of the raft. But that happens naturally. It happens because we want to. It happens because we start to see the raft is getting heavy. We've, we've done such a wonderful work to build the raft and to cross over and now we're we're starting to be like thinking oh wow this raft is starting it's like oh yeah it's it's, it's the only thing that's <laughs> keeping me tied up and so but there's no forcing this there's just understanding and it just happens naturally because it's it just feels better that's all
This is one thing properly expounded by the Blessed One, the Arahant, the perfectly enlightened one, who knows and sees, such that if a monk dwells in it, in it, diligent, ardent, and resolute, his unliberated mind is liberated, his undestroyed taints are destroyed, and he and he attains the as of yet unattained, unsurpassed security from bondage. Security from bondage is actually called yoga kema. It's interesting that the Buddha's teaching is actually the opposite of yoga. <laughs> it is yoga kema. Kema means uh, safety, safety from yoga, because yoga m means also to bind. I do not mean this as uh, any kind of, uh, I just, that's just the way it, it is. <laughs> I, I Personally, I was very interested in yoga prior to that, so when I discovered that the Buddha's teaching is actually, it's, it's actually quite different, it's quite interesting. Again, householder, with the subsiding of thought and Im examination, a monk enters and dwells in the second jhana. And then it goes over, it's, but it's a dot, dot, dot. So, then the third jhana, the fourth jhana, he considers this and understands it thus. This fourth jhana is constructed, produced by volition. But whatever is constructed and produced by volition, is impermanent, subject to cessation. If he or she is firm in this, they attain the distilling of the distractions. But if they do not attain the destruction of the taints because of that desire for the Dhamma, because of that delight in the Dhamma, then with the utter destruction of the five lower fetters, one becomes one of spontaneous birth, due to attain final Nibbana, there, without ever returning from that world. This too is one thing properly expounded by the Blessed One, the Arahant, the perfectly enlightened one, who knows and sees, such that if a monk or anybody dwells in in it one attains the as of yet unattained unsurpassed security from bondage again householder a monk dwells pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness likewise the second likewise the third likewise the fourth thus above below across and everywhere and to all as to himself or herself, he or she dwells pervading the entire world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, boundless love, vast, exalted, measureless, without enmity, without ill will. One considers this and understands it thus this liberation of mind by boundless love is constructed and produced by volition. But whatever is constructed and produced by volition is impermanent, subject to cessation. And by understanding this, there cannot be a dependence, which links back to the previous sutta, that grows. We understand it with wisdom. If he or she is firm in this, one attains the distilling of the mental movements, the distractions. But if one does not attain th that stillness because of that desire for the Dhamma, that delight in the Dhamma, then with the utter destructions of, of the five lower fetters, one becomes one of spontaneous birth due to attain final Nibbana there without ever returning from that world. Spontaneous birth, because devas, they 
born spontaneously, not from the womb. This too is one thing properly expounded by the Blessed One. Again, householder, a monk dwells pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion, imbued with joy, imbued with calm or steadiness of mind. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. Thus above, below, around, and everywhere across, to all as to himself, one dwells pervading the entire world with a mind imbued with boundless calm, vast, exalted, measureless, without enmity, without ill will. One considers this and understand it thus. This liberation of mind by boundless calm is constructed and produced by volition. Whatever is constructed and produced by volition is impermanent, subject to cessation. Goes again. Again, householder, with the complete surmounting of the perception of forms, with the passing away of the perception of sensory impingement, and non-attention to the perception of diversity, perceiving space is infinite. A monk enters and dwells in the base of infinity of space. One considers this and understands that thus this attainment of the base of infinity of space is constructed and produced by volition. And whatever is constructed and produced by volition is impermanent, subject to cessation. This too is one thing properly expounded by the Blessed One. Again, a householder, by completely surmounting the base of infinity of space, perceiving consciousness is infinite, one enters and dwells in the base of infinity of consciousness. By completely surmounting the base of infinity of consciousness, perceiving there is nothing, one enters and dwells in the base of nothingness. One considers this and understands it thus, this attainment of the base of nothingness is constructed and produced by volition, and whatever is constructed and produced by volition is impermanent, subject to cessation. If one is firm in this, one attains the destruction of the taints, and if one does not attain the, still, the stilling of the distractions, because of that desire for Dhamma, because of that delight in the Dhamma, then when the, with the utter letting go of the five lower fetters, one becomes one of spontaneous birth due to attain final Nibbana there without ever retain it, returning from that world. This too is one thing properly expounded by the Blessed One, the Arahant, the perfectly enlightened one, who knows and sees, such that if a monk dwells in it diligent, ardent, and resolute, their unliberated mind is liberated, and their undestroyed defilements are destroyed, and one attains the as of yet unattained, unsurpassed security from bondage. When this was said, the householder Dasama of Atakanagara said to the venerable Ananda, Bhante, just as if a man seeking one entrance to a hidden treasure all at once found eleven entrances to that treasure. So too, while I was seeking one door to the deathless, I have all at once gotten to hear eleven doors to the deathless. Just as if a man had a house with eleven doors, and when the house caught on fire, he could flee to safety through any of these eleven doors, so I can flee to safety through any of these eleven doors to the deathless. Bhante, these members of other sects seek a fee for their teacher, so why shouldn't I make an offering to the Venerable Ananda? 
Then the householder Dasama of Atakanagara assembled the Sangha of Bhikkhus from Pataliputta and, Ves and Vesali, and with his own hands he served and satisfied them with various kinds of good food. He presented a pair of cloths to each monks and a set of three robes to the Venerable Ananda. And he had and he had a dwelling worth five hundred built for the Venerable Ananda. It's quite um, more and more when we reflect upon that teaching like you were doing today like how <laughs> how um, what's the word you were using well hard to describe hard to how how could you even you know share that But the direct experience of uh, of uh, knowing these eleven doors is such an amazing gift of um, and the more the more they're seen the more it's uh, there is just this gratitude that just wells up so much <laughs> when uh, you know when when there's a sickness or something like that it's very it's quite interesting because when the mind is well developed like uh, this brahmin this old brahmin came to the buddha once and he is really old age like 100 plus years and he asked the Buddha what he should do. And the Buddha is like, well, it's the end of your life. You had to do something before, <laughs> you know. You had to like, <laughs> you like, why do you wait till the end, you know. He doesn't say it like that, obviously. He's more, he's more like the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> Not like me. But he, um, he says, in, in a house on fire, you take the vessel that is useful to you here and now so he says practice generosity he says now, now your house is on fire you know it's it's hard to meditate and he, there's he says in other discourses it's it's hard to strive when you you get really old because you don't have that capacity anymore you don't want to wait till then and but the house is the mind. You want to develop the mind. And when the mind is very well developed, whenever these things are going to happen and when sickness happens, there's barely any pain. There's no... Well, of course, there's going to be pain, but the mind is... Another simile that I really love is the well-thatched roof. Is that, you know, when the just like the this uh, the asavas you know the the defilements of the mind or whatever you know that that can bring you suffering when it's like rain on a well thatched roof it doesn't come in it doesn't affect you and so and that is, you know, <laughs> knowing the deathless is <laughs> not something you can, you know, you can't pay for that. <laughs> you, can, you can't just, you know, it doesn't have a price. It's when you're really, when you're actually s sick 
and you have that other place where you can go or you know you can actually be n apart from that sickness that's when the like the value gets to be understood a lot more when these things happen And often these things they they come up and since w they're not n there's nowhere to hold on for them the sickness and the things like that so whatever the natural causes it arises but then it just it's there's nothing to keep it there because it's just seen as what it is and so it often doesn't last as long and it doesn't have so much of an impact <laughs> so two teachings on the same thing not not meditating in dependence on any of the jhanas but knowing that they're there there's there's knowledge of them but it doesn't actually matter anymore <laughs> so because what what if you were to wish for something else it's not going to happen anyways <laughs> the, the path is the same it's been the same the whole time so whether you're in the first jhana you wish to be in nothingness well, just that wish is a hindrance that will keep you from going there and now it's the more we go the more we really understand that and the more it's all about just finding the time to actually dedicate to viveka seclusion until meditation so on this <laughs> <laughs>